Well, thank you so much for the invite. I'm glad to be part of the Horticulture Wednesday again. And I was excited to get asked to talk about these home invading insects, the ones that want to overwinter in our structures. This is a very uh, universal problem. Humans the world over deal with this issue. You can see with uh, some aggravated people and dog in that image on the right there, sweeping stink bugs off their front porch. This is something that we contend with every year. And I just kind of want to talk about the basic biology behind some of this and why it's a difficult problem to control. And then also talk about some of the specific species that we encounter. So our homes are very attractive to arthropods. When we're talking about arthropods, we're talking about insects and arachnids and all the myriapods, which include those, uh, the, the centipedes and the millipedes, also crustaceans, things like pill bugs, also known as roly polies. These arthropods, they're just like every other living animal on earth. They need food, water, shelter, and somewhere where they can lay their eggs. And our homes and our office buildings and our garages offer all of this in quite a bit of abundance. In terms of food, if we just go to the kitchen, you've got garbage that's usually sitting there. That's an available food resource. We'll have crumbs that are hiding behind our ovens and our refrigerators. If you've got a small child like me at home, there's also crumbs basically all throughout the house as they trail animal crackers everywhere. Uh, you can also find food in the form of dog food, just sort of sitting out in the open. And then we have our pantries where we have a lot of stored products as well. Water, we provide through leaky pipes, through faucets, through moisture accumulation in tubs. We have toilets just sitting there with water out in the open. We have moisture issues in basements and in attics. Shelter, our buildings provide a lot of different nooks and crannies for these insects to take advantage of. And they're also gonna lay their eggs there. So it is a very attractive situation for them to try and get into and take advantage of. Research from North Carolina State has actually shown that human dwellings and human buildings typically have about 100 species of arthropods that live inside of them. Now that biodiversity can vary house to house and city to city, of course, but by and large, it averages right around 100 species. A lot of this 100 species is made up of things like flies, you can also see there are spiders, beetles, and bees, wasps, and ants that pop up in there the majority of the time. But then we have a smattering of other things. We have true bugs like seed bugs and bed bugs. We have cockroaches. You may have some moths that get into the home. We have crickets and ticks and things that sometimes pop up in there. So 100 species, that's pretty impressive. I know that may sound like a nightmare to some of you for an entomologist. This, just, this is a bunch of awesome roommates basically that I get to hang out with and see even over the winter. But for a normal human being that's not an entomologist, this is a very weird statistic to find out. Now, most of these we're never going to meet. Most of these arthropods that are in the home, they're not an issue. Some of them can become a little more pesty than others. I would point to things like ants, cockroaches, termites. These are things that are annoying if you're talking about ants uh, that can be disease carriers if you're talking about cockroaches. Cockroaches are also a huge factor in asthma and allergy issues in urban areas. And then we also have structural problems that we would associate with the termites. So of course, we don't wanna discount all of these arthropods that I was just mentioning. But with these, we have, we have solutions. We have things that we can do for those pest species. A lot of them can be managed through elimination of things that they want, especially sources of food and water. When we manipulate those levels of food and water, we're changing what we call the carrying capacity in the for the population in our home. The carrying capacity is the highest number of any given species that can survive in a distinct area. My example there on the left is a goldfish bowl. The goldfish bowl can happily and healthily hold about three goldfish, but if you look on the other side of that image, it can't hold 30 goldfish. There's not enough resources for them to survive in there. So if we manipulate the levels of food and water and space in our homes, we're using an integrated pest management approach to try and combat things like ants and roaches and termites. They're not as interested in the place, they don't wanna be there, and they can't survive as well if they do move in. So this is a lot of cultural control, things where we're doing sanitation, for example, to remove food and water. That image on the left there, we've got a pile, a bunch of dishes and cups and, and bowls in the sink, showing a lot of food and water resources for something like a roach to take advantage of, sanitizing that can help to cut down on their interest. They'll walk in and be like, this place stinks. There's no food. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to drink. I'm out of here. I hate it here. Uh, we can also empty things like our garbage cans regularly to cut down on attraction for flies and fruit fly type pests and limit manageable shelter spaces. If you have 
a lot of boxes that are in your storage areas, trying to make sure that they're not all touching or cutting down on clutter in a, in a more sweeping way can help to reduce areas where they can hide and survive. So all of these cultural methods are great for keeping out these pests. We can also secure the perimeter of our homes with screens, with caulking, uh, with secure piping. All of these reduce the amount of pests that can get inside. A pest outside is usually not a pest at all. A cockroach outdoors isn't a problem for you, it's outside. So for all of these things that become a problem in our homes, there are solutions, there are things that we can do, and we have integrated pest management approaches for them. Some insects are a little more difficult to deal with once they get inside and for the reasons that they want to get inside. We'll talk about insects in winter and cold here more in a moment, but insects do not like the cold. Many of you may sympathize with this. It may be the only time that you ever sympathize with an insect's sentiment, but they don't want to be cold. They can't handle it very well. And then that means that they need to find somewhere safe for themselves to overwinter. And a lot of insects are using our homes, our garages, our office buildings, our warehouses as an overwintering site. When they do this, they don't need food, water, or anywhere to lay their eggs. They just need somewhere to kind of hide out for those cold months. And they're there because of the heat that we're providing. And it's very difficult for us to give that heat up because we also need that in order to be successful and survive over the winter. The insects, they need a, probably a little more than us. They don't tolerate cold temperatures very well. So in the winter on a species by species basis, they have to come up with what we call an overwintering strategy. And just to very, very broadly simplify this down, this means that they're either going to avoid cold temperatures or they're going to try and survive the cold temperatures. Now, the ones that wanna survive the cold temperatures, those have adapted over time to be able to do things like can produce bodily fluids that control their freezing point. A famous example is the woolly bear caterpillar seen here on the left, famous harbinger of fall, something that we uh, have folk tales about predicting the weather. I think what's very interesting about them is that they don't actually can predict the weather for us over the winter. We have data sets on this that you can't predict how cold the winter is going to be with them. But they themselves are able to produce antifreeze inside their bodies in order to lower their freezing point. So instead of freezing at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, they can get themselves all the way down to zero and they're able to avoid freezing to death in the winter. Others can, so, uh, other species of insects can uh, control where the ice crystals form in their body. So they force them to grow in their fat bodies or in other water-based areas. And they avoid getting ice crystals on their brains, on their hearts or in their digestive tract. And so they're able to survive having ice crystals form in them by being able to control where they actually pop up. A very fascinating way of going about this. For other species though, they just, they don't wanna be around it. They don't wanna be around the cold and they're gonna migrate as far away as possible as they can from cold temperatures. They're just like the snowbirds that live in Kentucky. They go to Arizona, they go to Florida, they're like, to heck with this, I'm out of here. And they go anywhere else that they can. A famous example of this is the monarch. We're seeing this right now. The monarchs are migrating from our Northern portions of the United States down through Kentucky and other Southern states to get down to Mexico where they will spend the winter. It's more tropical there. They're able to survive. They don't stick around for these cold temperatures that are about to arrive in our state. Others will actually sort of migrate locally. Instead of leaving the entire country, they will stick around, but they're trying to find somewhere where they can get a warm spot. Basically, this is going to turn into using natural things that they can use to put something between them and the air temperature. We get a lot of questions on this every year about, oh, it was this cold this day in the winter, surely that froze all the insects. And it's important to note that just because the air temperature in a certain area maybe is two degrees, that doesn't mean that down in the soil litter, uh, the leaf litter on the soil, down in the dirt, inside of trees, in these places where the insects have found to hide, it's usually a little bit warmer there, maybe five to 10 degrees warmer, depending on the substrate. And so they're avoiding those cold air temperatures and they're able to survive. Some examples of this would include using the soil with white grubs. White grubs will burrow down below the frost line in the soil. And that's why they're able to survive over winter to pupate and become adult Japanese beetles or May beetles the next year. We also see them use leaf litter. We have some lady beetles doing that in the center image here. Some use logs. Some insects even construct 
a harborage to help them accomplish this or to protect their offspring. Bagworms, the female and the males, they both produce these bags over their caterpillar bodies. The female never actually leaves her bag. So she stays in there her entire life and her eggs are hidden in there with her. She perishes in the autumn, but that bag is still there to protect her eggs. And they, those bags keep those eggs safe up to, I wanna say about negative five, negative eight degrees. Uh, they're, they're still not going to freeze if the air temperature is that because the bag is nice and toasty on the inside. So it's kind of an amazing way of sneaking around and doing this to avoid those cold temperatures. The problem has become that our homes and our buildings can mimic, and in some cases, even supplant some of these natural overwintering sites. A lot of insects, like I mentioned, they wanna use the soil or leaf litter. Some of them use rock faces or logs, and our homes can look sort of similar to this. There are other things about our homes that are very attractive. They can sense the heat. You've heard about uh, the, the heat leaching out of your home and having all these energy problems uh, for the last few years. This is something that insects can actually detect. They can be like, oh, it's, it's very warm in that direction. I think I'm gonna crawl that way towards that deluxe heated log that looks really nice. And that's what I'm gonna use for the winter. They also like the colors that we use, which can be very natural if we're painting or if we've used bricks or rock in the construction. Those are, those are substrates that they're familiar with. And so it feels very familiar to them and homey. We also like South and Western exposures on our homes for beauty's sake, but insects like South and Western exposures for the heat that is produced from the sun on those surfaces. Our homes are also usually quite tall. So they may be up on a hill and therefore are more obvious, or they may be taller than the trees that are around the home. And that means that this looks like the tallest tree in the neighborhood. And that's what the insects key in on. Once they land on the home or on the building, there's also usually very easy access. There's gaps in our perimeter security. There's a hole in your caulking. There's a hole in your screen. There's a gap at the bottom of a door. There's something where they can crawl up and get into an attic or a soffit. There's usually very easy potential for them to inhabit the space. So for all those reasons, we deal with these pests. And I just wanted to cover some of the, the more common ones here today. The first one I wanna mention is the box elder bug. So the box elder bug is sort of one of our more famous uh, uh, fall invaders. This is, an, as an adult, they're around half an inch long. They're black and red in coloration. If we look behind their head, they have these three stripes that look almost like a duck's toes. They, they splay out like that and they're red in color right behind their head. During the summer, the box elder bugs, they're outside on seed bearing box elder trees. More commonly, they're found on female trees of the box elder, also sometimes seen on ash and maple trees. They're feeding on those seed pods. They have a needle-like mouth part that they use to suck juices out of that plant in order to get their nutrition. They have those needle-like mouth parts, which puts them in the true bug category, also known as the hemipterans, which means that they exhibit incomplete metamorphosis. They start out as an egg, and then the egg hatches into a nymph. In nymphal development, we see that the insect looks vaguely similar to its adult form throughout its life. It's generally the same shape, usually the same colors as well. As they grow, they get bigger and they develop wing pads, which develop into their full-fledged wings when they actually become an adult. So that's what we see with this incomplete metamorphosis. As the box elder develops, it darkens in color, but maintains some of that red color. There's also a yellow dot and stripe that appears on their back that's eventually covered up by the wings. You can see it slowly disappear over their life here. Outside, we don't really consider this to be a big pest. They cause minimal damage to trees. It really is something that's considered a nuisance pest due to their invading homes in the fall. The adults move from their overwintering spot in April and May. They seek out the box elder trees and then lay their eggs in the barks and crevices in June. Those eggs hatch. The nymphs will develop over the summer. We usually have one to two generations, sometimes two generations here in Kentucky. And then that second generation is going to be the one that wants to overwinter. In most cases, it's adults that want to overwinter, but there will be some nymphs mixed in as well. So as we head into September and October, this is when they start to make their way towards their overwintering sites. They know that it's getting colder. They can sense those dropping temperatures. They naturally wanna be on rocks and on trees that have large south and western exposures so that they can be heated and have a nice winter. But once they get on buildings, they'll also like the south side of that building. 
So the box elder bug tends to congregate there and get inside that way. On the homes, they're going to look for any nook or cranny they can in order to set up inside of there for insulation from the cold. So getting down between these slats of wood, uh, getting up into the attic, anywhere that they can find where they can kind of sneak their way in and then feel very comfy and secure once they get inside. They do not feed on the house. They don't feed on your plants that are in there. They don't bite people or anything like that. They really are entering this period of arrested development. They're not going to do anything for the winter. They wanna be as still as possible so that they can begin the whole process anew next year. Now, that being said, when we get these sometimes warm days in the winter that can wake them up, they're like, oh, it's spring already. Little do they realize that it's January. And once they try to get near the windows, they'll usually get very cold again. It's very annoying for people to see these walking around. They're also a bit smelly. Sometimes they stain fabric surfaces if they've gotten around clothing or furniture items. It's just not something that people like dealing with. And we've been dealing with it for a long time. So that's one of the classic ones. Some of the other ones that are quite famous for invading our home include the multicolored Asian lady beetle. This is an invasive species. In the summer, we would consider these to be beneficial predators when they're out in the landscape, but in the fall, they do become a problem. These have lots of names. If you, if you talk to folks around the country or even just around the state, you'll hear lots of different terms thrown around. Some people just call them Asian ladybugs. Some people call them the Halloween beetle which I think is very apt because they're kind of an orange and black color. Halloween is also when we start to see them very commonly in the home. Excuse me, what's up? <laughs> uh, we also hear sometimes people call them Asian beetles or they get confused and call these Japanese beetles. I'll be very frank, I've heard some, some nasty terms and racist type things thrown around with these types of insects. So I like to be very specific and say, this is the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And if you want to shorten it to anything, the best one is M-A-L-B or MALB. That's one of the acronyms we use for it. Like all lady beetles, they do go through complete metamorphosis where they start as an egg, which hatches into a larva. The larval form looks very different from the adult form. They will pupate and then become the adult. We see this type of development with beetles, with moths and butterflies, as well as with bees and wasps. As a group, lady beetles will overwinter as adults in these large aggregations like you see on the right. Generally speaking, they wanna use logs and leaf litter, but hey, a house is a nice substitute if you can get it. If you look at that log, all of those individual red dots, those are lady beetles. They produce a pheromone that says, hey, party over here, this is the party log. Everybody wants to spend the winter here. And then they will all congregate together to keep nice and warm for the winter. They also exhibit what the lady beetles are famous for as a group, which we call aposematism or warning coloration. This is where the insect advertises its presence rather than being cryptic and hiding and having camouflage. They're literally brightly colored and it says, hey, I'm right here. And if you mess with me, something bad will happen to you. What happens when you mess with a lady beetle is that they reflexively bleed, they bend their knees and out will come a blood-like substance. It is very foul smelling, it's very musky and it's very bitter. I know this because I'm a weird entomologist. Of course, I've tasted it, and it's not a, a nice thing to have on your tongue. A lizard or a bird that does this will then associate these bright colors and the patterns that they see on the ladybug with that nasty taste and avoid eating them. The multicolored Asian lady beetle exhibits this as well. They're interesting because their coloration can vary uh, just individual to individual. Some of them are reddish in color. Some of them are orange. Some are more of a yellow orange to almost a pale khaki color. They can have zero spots or they can have up to 19 spots. The immature form is black with two orange stripes and four orange dots on it. You can see that on the right. The way that we properly identify this species is to look on top of their thorax in this area that lots of people think is their eyes, that black and white area. And if you look very closely, you will see a letter M stamped on top of all of these Asian lady beetles. This stands for, of course, multicolored Asian lady beetle. I think it's very polite of them to have their initial right there on top. The multicolored Asian lady beetle was introduced to the United States on purpose. It was part of a biological control experiment. The first introduction was in California in 1916. There were later introductions in the 1980s, and those are the ones that led to establishment, which started in Louisiana. 
It was originally thought that the winter killed this pest every time it came in. Uh, but unfortunately, that ended up not being true by the end of the 20th century. And we started to see all of these home invasions. Other things that we associate with this, uh, not just that it was brought in for biocontrol, it's still sold for that. It does help to control soybean aphid. Many people don't like the species because they fear that it's reducing our native species, like the pink ladybug. It's not fully understood if that's happening. There's some recent data that casts doubt on that but it's still not great to have this invasive species kind of running around, particularly when we associate it with these other problems. If you handle them, they will bite you. It, it's not gonna draw blood, they don't pass any diseases, but it is a sharp pain. Uh, they're aggressive, so once you pick one up, it'll give you a quick nip on the tip of your finger, and then it will try it to fly away. They also infest fall ripening fruit. If you are going to spend any time in an orchard as you celebrate autumn this year, you might notice in the apples that are on the ground or kind of hanging out in the trees still, if there's a wound on that apple, you may see multicolored Asian lady beetles hanging out inside of there. They're eating the sugary pulp that's in there. They also do this to blueberries uh, sometimes and uh, more importantly, grapes. If you look on the right there, these are some ones that are hanging out on grapes. They will hide out in the husks that they create or they just hang out in the bunches of grapes. And if those get thrown into a vat that's going into wine production, they will die. And then all of that foul, bitter compound that I mentioned before will leak out of them and it gets into the wine. And I don't know about any of you, but when I'm looking for a bouquet in a wine, you know, I want those vanilla notes, maybe some sort of oaky flavor. I don't really want ladybug taint, which is what we end up with in this case. It's bitter. It's gross. It doesn't take very many of them to spoil the wine as well. So there are some issues outside with this, but the big one is when the temperatures drop and their food starts to dwindle, they move towards their overwintering strikes. They are attracted to light colored homes. They want ones with large south or west facing exposures, and they prefer houses that are taller than their neighbors or ones that are sort of taller than the trees around them. They, uh, naturally speaking, they want the tallest tree that they can find. And so they will also do that with homes. They find cracks and crevices and enter and go into concealed areas where they will wait out the winter. You can see a few of them do this, or you can see many of them do that, as you see in the image on the right. They end up in attics, wall voids, ceilings, crawl spaces, and soffits. Again, they're not feeding or mating at this time. They are simply waiting out the cold months. I like this image from Florida on the right because it shows the variation in color very well, some of the brighter reds and duller khaki colors. These, once they're inside, they're not doing anything to you, but they can be annoying. They'll wake up on warm days and crawl around. You can actually hear them. They get in high enough numbers that we can hear them in our attics or on our wall voids, and they can be quite smelly. They will bleed if they're agitated. They will also die if they aren't careful. They'll dry out and then start desiccating. And once that occurs, you can have these big piles of dead bugs, which attracts things like carpet beetles and other problems to the home as well. The reflexive bleeding is known to stain light colored objects and on certain people it may induce a dermatological reaction. You might end up with a rash if you handle them enough. The final species I'll mention is the brown marmorated stink bug, an invasive stink bug introduced from Asia. It is uh, something that started in Pennsylvania in 2001. They are primarily an ag pest that feeds on fruits and vegetables. They insert their needle-like mouth part into these fruits and vegetables and they suck out juices. It causes this corkiness that you see on the right and discoloration ultimately renders a lot of food products to be inedible. They get their name from their mottled brown and bronze appearance. They have this sort of speckly coloration all over their body. They have smooth shoulders. If you look at them, it almost looks like they're wearing shoulder pads. This is different than the rough stink bug or some of our other native species. So it's helpful for diagnostics. You can also look at their antenna. They have these white bands on their antennae, which help to separate them from some native species. And if we flip them over, they have this grayish colored belly, which is different than the brown stink bug, which has a more lime colored belly in comparison. So that's what they do outside. That's what they look like. Uh, they love to get into human buildings. They love homes, office buildings, warehouses. I know that I kill several of them uh, very often in my office here on campus. I think that they're invading from outside. It could also be because my neighbor here in Ag North is Rick Besson. 
And I think he keeps these in his office sometimes, uh, not as a pet, but for science reasons. And they, they escape and come over and say hi to me. But you can see they make these large congregations like we see in this image. Once inside, no longer feeding, no longer mating, just really wanna reiterate that point, but they get active on warmer days. They are smelly. Some folks liken it to coriander. I do think it's kind of a spicy smell. You'll have to let me know what you think stink bug stink smells like. You can type it into the chat if you would like. Um, I haven't tasted these, but I have smelled a lot of them trying to figure out what to liken it to. Some people can get exposed to these so often that they end up developing an allergic uh, reaction to exposure to the chemicals inside of them. They prefer high and cool locations. If you look in that image on the left there, that's a lot of stink bugs that are trying to get into that guy's house. It is the night of the living stink bug. They're trying to break in and overwinter in that spot. They like soffits, they like attics, they'll get under siding as well. All of these insects that I've mentioned today, they like narrow spaces. You may have heard the phrase snug as a bug in a rug. It's very true for insects. They want to feel protected. They want something touching them on all sides. So they usually get into cracks, They'll get behind boards. They like to be behind and around window and door trim. These will also enter around exhaust fans and lights and ceilings. These incursions that they produce are true invasions. You can see thousands of stink bugs in and on a home. This image on the right is from Penn State. Over two days, they collected 532 brown marmorated stink bugs in one person's home in the autumn. We can try and cut down on some of this by reducing the lights that are on outside during the peak flight or switching to non-insect attractant light bulbs if we have to have security lighting outside. But this will cut down on the amount of these stink bugs that want to move in. You can see how attracted they are to lights there on the left. The other things that I would promote when we're dealing with these overwintering pests is that prevention is your greatest defense. You have to go out and secure the perimeter. This means going around and installing weather stripping around doors and windows, reduce or replacing the rubber seals that are along the bottoms of your garage doors and your house doors, checking screens, fixing caulking gaps, using these caulking solutions that you see here. Think of yourself like the kid in Home Alone. You wanna set as many things between you and the bugs so that they can't get inside and bother you. I wouldn't recommend blow torches and all the things that he used in this movie, but all of the different things that I was just highlighting, screens and caulking, these are helpful prevention tips. Insecticides always come up, Sometimes it is warranted if you deal with this problem every year, if you're the house that they like best because you're the tallest or the most natural looking, uh, then you can get somebody to treat for you. We like to promote that a professional come in and be the one that make these applications. Other times people really, really, really want to do this on their own. And the most often we use product for that is ortho home defense, which is a bifenthrin insecticide. These products, they can only be used in a very specific way. You can't just simply go out and spray the entire exterior of a home. Home defense in particular can only go three feet up from the foundation and one foot out into the landscape. You can go around the whole home and do that on all of it that you can reach, but you can't just go and spray the entire wall. You can also treat around the windows and you can spot treat on eaves and on soffits, but you can't just treat the entire roof of your house either. This is one reason we like to try and get professionals promoted because they know those rules and regulations as licensed folks. The other thing is that people will see these groups of bugs sort of hanging out on their house, which is the precursor to them wanting to be in the house and they wanna spray them with something. So one thing that I think it's very efficient to promote and easy and economical for people is to just spray them with soapy water. If you see a group of lady beetles hanging out on your siding, if you see a group of stink bugs buzzing around your light bulbs or around your window, then just mix together a little bit of dish soap and water in a spritz bottle, a backpack sprayer if you got it, and spray that grouping of them. The soap destroys parts of their body. They quickly perish. It works against a whole host of insects. There's a low stain hazard and low toxicity issues for the environment by using this. It is a good alternative to using something like home defense. Indoors, also we have to think about insecticides. People often wanna spray inside, but the best thing to do once you see them inside is simply vacuuming them up or sweeping them up with a broom. Remove those bugs, dump them out outside. Uh, if you want, you can dump them in a bucket of soapy water to kill them. But usually once you get them bagged up or in the canister of the vacuum cleaner, you can just dump it 
into a trash can or somewhere outside and get rid of them. If they do accumulate indoors, they can attract cluster flies and carpet beetles and other problems. So we definitely wanna get them out. Indoor insecticide applications are not going to help. These things are contact-based, so the insect has to crawl through it. And these insects aren't really crawling. Otherwise, you have to get it right on top of them. So you have to crawl into your attic or get into a wall void in order to make the application. Some people try to get around this by using a bug bomb. Bug bombs very rarely work for anything. We don't normally advocate for them in extension for anything. And in particular with this, you would be releasing high amounts of pesticide residues. They would drift into areas of human habitation, exposing the people that live in the home. They also rarely work. They're also pressurized, so they can almost be explosive if used incorrectly. So we do wanna be very cognizant of that when we're making our recommendations to folks. Limit the amount of insecticides they're putting out, use these preventative measures, and cultural sanitation practices once the pests are inside. With that, I appreciate the invite to be with you here today. I hope I showed you some stuff about invaders that will be helpful during this autumn season. And I hope that if you have any questions, you'll let me know.